My honourable and dear respected ulama, dear brothers and elders and mothers and sisters, building the relationships in the 21st century has become a big challenge of today. One of the aims we've got, or the aim I, I wish to inspire, is for us as a community and, a fa and to focus more on the family unit and upbringing of children. That's, that's my aim of today, to kind of inspire with you some ideas. Hopefully by the end of today, the idea is that you'd walk away with some understanding of some more of the problems which we face, some important aspects of tarbiyah, specifically for children living in UK and families that are living in UK, but it's very much tailored for a Western audience because of some of the unique challenges we face. And last but not least, the need of the hour is for us to become completely focused on this family unit. So to understand the problems, important aspects of tarbiyah, and to have a complete focus from the here go, from now on, on the family unit itself. Let me share with you something really interesting. It's, it's, it was quite an interesting study that was done, right? There was a scientific study on happiness. This is the question, isn't it? Wait, I, I want to be happy. I, 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 tell me how to be happy. It's the question that everybody asks. If I ask some of our community elders here, uh, why did you come to UK? The reality is a lot of us came here seeking better pastures because we were told that England, you know, like, like, go there, brother, it's better. You learn more money, you'll have a good life. There are some brothers and sisters from our community that have fled uh, crisis, um, war-torn countries and so on. But the majority of us came here because we sought prosperity, isn't it? So everyone is an actual seek of happiness because if you knew money wouldn't provide utility and happiness, it's futile pursuing money because it's not providing anything. So you ultimately are in search for happiness. Money is a means to happiness. Go to England, you'll get money. So this is the circle we find our communities in. The Western world also asks this question as well. Even within those countries, like for example, America and the quote unquote Western world, West is no longer a direction anymore, it's a thought. It's a thinking process. It's an ideology. So there was this study that was done anyway in America, in a particular university, and they asked the question. The, the question was, what makes a good life? So they, did a start, they started with 724 participants in this study. Subhanallah, now this study goes on to include up to 1,300 descendants of their family members. It's a massive study. It's the longest study ever done. This is one of the longest studies in the history they've ever done. They've been tracking these people for 84 years. So imagine the sample size and imagine how long they've been actually studying these people for. Every two years, what they do is that each participant, 1,300 people, they answer a lengthy questionnaire. Every five years, they have to surrender medical records. And every 15 years, they have to have a face-to-face -face in interview and they've collated all this data. You know the khulasa, the summary, the lubilubab, the hasil, the end result is this one sentence. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Bas. That's the khulasa they came to. They said, we've got no other solution. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Now, alhamdulillah, for us, the family unit is of importance. Because the Prophet wasallam he mentioned, you know, and showed demonstratingly that how important family is, looking after the, the wives, the children, having concern for the wider you know, family and so on, the silatul rahim, joining family ties, foregoing, letting go of your egos for the sake of others. This is something within, alhamdulillah, our Islamic DNA, you get me? But when we ask, right, is that when we look at precise, or rather let's look at before what a family unit used to be, a family unit used to be a closed unit of people and they would nurture and care for one another. I mean, I don't know about you guys, right? So, some of you guys who are born and bred here, well, perhaps there are a lot of you are, Believe it or not, there was a time, right, that my grandfather came from uh, one village and literally there'd be one sort of like, I don't know what to call a haveli, right, in English, but like a, a yard is not the correct translation. Compound, maybe that's the correct word. So it would literally be like a big square compound, one corner, one grandfather lived, another literally at six, three houses, three brothers here, three brothers here, a sister here, and everyone would live in this one house. They would have a central cooking place and... It was shared responsibilities, and these were brothers and sisters sharing from the same foods. If you're in upset, we're upset. If you're ill, we, we, we tend to you, we look after you. And this was what is defined as a family unit once upon a time. This was my respected grandfather, the halat he went, he lived through. And I remember visiting, when I studied in Pakistan, I went to visit this village, right, which he's from. If anybody is from Pakistan area, my, father, my, my background, my mom's English. She's a like, convert or a revert. So she's pure white, English, 
Smith family specifically. My dad's Pakistani, so I went, when I was studying in Pakistan, I went to this Gra, the Chuck, the village, the old school where it all started from. And subhanAllah, it was so humble and so simple. Mud walls, mud houses, literally like wood beams on the roof, simple individuals. Subhanallah, I remember going there and uh, I, I said to them, I need to go to the toilet. And they said, okay, just go outside, the toilet's there. And they said, just keep on walking and it will come. And I, wallahi, me being, wallahi, unaware, gullible. I never, this is no joke, a real, I'm telling you a real story. So I walk out and I'm walking, walking. And I said to one individual, one elder, and I'll, for those who understand Urdu and Punjabi, it makes sense, but I'll translate. I said to him, Mawaji, Uncle, where's the toilet? He goes, This is his response. He goes, son, the field is open. Wherever you want to drop one, do one. And I was like, subhanallah, like us westernized snowflakes. I'm thinking to go there and find the nice toilet, shower, bumper, you know, those Muslim showers. Like we're so snowflakes. And then subhanallah, I was like, what do, you, what do I do now? So I just, luckily I had one of those Pakistani chadars. Yeah, those shawls. Cover myself, do my thing, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking any time a snake can come and do some deadliness. I'm just thinking constantly like a, like a Westerner. So the point is, I'm sharing that with you because we came from these humble backgrounds. This is my humble background. My grandfather, they used to cut sag, spinach, eat, lass, drink lassi, bake their own breads, and that was family life. What changed? My grandfather migrated to England. And this is a lot of story for all of us. Our elders came from these economically harsh environments, difficult scenarios, tough backgrounds, hard reality. What's changed for our communities is this. With the coming of wealth, our hearts have become more distant. Seriously. With the coming of wealth, our hearts have actually become more distant. There was a time, like I said, that in one house, four or five brothers, a couple of sisters, everyone, you know, everyone would look after each other, share each other's concerns. Now, subhanAllah, because of a red passport and because I've got one house more than you, it becomes economic strife and competition. We compare our kids to our sons. You look at his kids, look at ours, like, you know, do your nothing, look at what they're doing, look what we're doing. And this, unfortunately, has become the, the, the order of the day. And the truth is, in, those, in that time, the men used to, historically, this is a historic thing, Alhamdulillah, and we're proud to say this as well, that men are the breadwinners, you get me? You don't be some simp and make your missus go to work, you work. And only if you need to, that's a different ma'asla fiqh, you, are, you consult your local ulama. But historically, men have been the breadwinners of the family. They're the ones who support. It's your fard, your responsibility. If your missus earns, that's her money, not yours. You are still, if she's a millionaire and you work in your local asda, shopping and stacking shelves, bruv, you are responsible to put food on her table. So it's your job. So the point is, I say that when I say on oh, men historically did the work, so it's the anti-feminism. Bro, keep your, please, let's not go into that direction, please. So I'll go before I go off on a tangent. Point is, if I could take a step back again, I said men were the breadwinners. So men would go and bang out a 12, 14 hour shift. Do you know what I'm saying? And because now everyone's kids would be around, you'd have like the elder grandmother, grandfather, they would make torbi of the kids. They wouldn't let the kids mess around. The aunties used to look at the, you know, the, the, the you know, in our different terminology, the chachi, the chachi, the tai, you get me, like the, your aunties, they would be keeping an eye on you. you. You couldn't move left and right. So there was a system in place where the tarbiyah of kids was happening. There was a mahol and an environment. It was wholesome and indecent. We've now transformed, or rather transformed, we've now gone. We've come to these sorts of shores where we've kept up the same work ethic and we haven't, we've made that gap now where the tarbiyah which was once provided by the family unit no longer exists as much as it did when we came from our host countries. Do you understand what I'm saying, yeah? This is a big issue. This is the start of where the problem can start and did start. And then those people who are constantly involved morning, noon and night working, their priority now became the focus and acquisition of wealth because I came to England because I want to earn money. So children grew up in an environment, lack of tarbiyah, lack of connection with the family, and what's happened is slowly, 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 the gulf has increased. What we've seen in, in UK, and I'll, I'll give you this as an example, if there was a hundred, and this is not a definitive statistic, I'm just giving you by way of example, if you have a hundred people practicing, and they were practicing people when they came, and that's assuming they were practicing, out of that hundred, would it be fair to say that at least a good size, well, let's just say 60-70% at least retain some shakal, some identity. A few of them slowly, slowly lost the plot after first generation. But as the generations go on, the connection with the deen becomes less and less because you're not always going to get 100% of transfer of values because you're living around people with different ideologies. Do you understand that? 
because you're living around people, naturally you're gonna think, develop ideas, so you will never have 100% of a transfer of an ideology, if and unless you become super insular and super everything anti to everybody else, but that mentality will not and cannot survive because we're not those types of people. So this is where the challenge is. So if you are not making an effort constantly on the tarbiyah of your family, those values are gonna get watered down very fast. So in the acquisition of wealth, what's happened? This is exactly what's happened. We've allowed this gap to exist within the, within, within the family. Now, it would be fair to say, right, that at this moment we have a problem where, not, not majority, but this is becoming common, where there is an absence of the father and child relationship. Father and child, father and son, father and daughter. Mother is there because in our community still, it's very taboo for women to work. So the men still do the work. But where they're generally not at home a lot of the time, because of the types of jobs and work we do, we're not family business oriented people as a whole in our community. So we work white collar jobs and hard work and so on. So there's an absence or a lack of connection of father with children. And in our community, it's the father who does the tarbiyah. The mums are the more softer ones. Not to say that they can't. I was raised by a single mum. Do you get it? So it, they can make the tarbiyah. The point is, is that this is the general norm and customs continue and they continue to go until we break a cycle. Right, now if you've understood that, once you have this issue where there's a disconnect, who then becomes the role model for the child? Who then does the child look up to? Well, because they're mingling with people outside, that's when they're now susceptible to gang violence, gang affiliation, crime. And if they don't go down that route, do you know what the next biggest source of influence is? This. This is their new influence. Because you can sit at home in Huddersfield, in your little bedroom, and mum and dad are thinking you're studying for your GCSEs, A-levels, or your SATs, or whatever the case may be, and you are joining online communities. Your influence is coming from a mobile. Now, the truth is, your influence is not manifested. You get me? If I'm affected ideologically, it doesn't print and tattoo on my forehead. Do you hear what I said? If you are affected ideologically, it's not gonna print on your forehead. If I come here with a hashal, you know, la samah Allah, but if I came here with a broken arm or somebody, I would identify and say, gee, he's got a broken arm. If someone come here with a bus leg, I would say, man's got a bus leg. Any physical malady or illness, we would identify. Inner turmoil does not manifest itself quickly. Unless you are active, constantly asking, having dialogue, you won't know. And then what happens, because you've been convinced that somebody else is right, there's a block towards you. Hence, we have irtidad amongst our community, an all-time high where one website boasts that there is 8,000 people that are murtad in Bradford alone. And this is one of the many quote-unquote Muslim towns. So like I said, look, it's not all doom and gloom. Don't think, oh, 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 oh toba, toba, you know, like, what do we... Bro, there's a solution to the problem. And like I said to you, that my aim of the object here is to inspire people to focus more on the family unit and upbringing. That's it, simple. Now, just for a source of comfort, for a source of comfort, just because some people may think, or they may be sitting here and thinking, I'm already in this situation. My kids have gone far off the track. Well, let's, uh, let me ask you a question. Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een. A lot of them who are more senior, they weren't young, they didn't accept Islam and be reared into Islam. They were those who abandoned a life of jahiliyyah and entered into the deen. Yes? Do you agree? Right. It was the efforts that brought them onto the deen. You can make a U-turn so long as you are ready and willing to make the effort. So there is a solution. It's not doom and gloom to say, well, listen, make effort. Make effort, inshallah, and the solution can be solved, but you have to be willing. The question is, what is your priority? Is it your chip shop in Huddersfield, your goti in Bindi, or your cryptocurrency, or your stocks and shares, or is it the family unit and your kids, who if you are using the excuse that I'm working so hard to provide for, they need your presence in terms of physical presence, not your presence that you buy on Amazon and eBay. So this is why I said it's not all doom and gloom, inshallah. But the, what, this is why I said maintaining a strong relationship is a challenge and it's more overwhelming now than it has ever come before. And social media, we've given our kids because we feel that if they're not having these devices, they may feel deprived. But yet we put no blocks in place and anything alternative and there's a one-sided stream of information. We won't realize the damage and done until it's done beyond its time of, and then it becomes very difficult to repair. Not impossible to repair, but difficult.
And the way to understand it is like this, that if I were to show you a piece of paper like this, and I were to straighten it and put it back down, is there still a crease in the paper? There's still a crease. What do you have to do to get rid of the crease? Uh, um, simple question, guys. Um, there's no, don't worry, there's no penalty points or if... Iron it, iron it. Iron it and then you have to put a garam istri, bruv, you get me? Or completely twist it the other way and then it will come back to normality. So we have to make a double effort than to bring our kids back. But if you were to just, if we, not you, we as a community, because your child's problem is mine. Yeah, do you understand that? Yeah. Wallahi, listen, if you, if you think of yourself as nationalities, you are goosed. It's not a Pakistani issue, or a Gambian issue, or a Jazairi issue, or a Maghrib Tunas Kurdi issue. This is an Ummah issue. And until and unless we don't think like an Ummah, you will be rinsed and you will not have no existence. As one sheikh mentioned, you will be like a grain of rice within a sack, no value, no branding, no consistency, and of no importance within the worldly life. Al Muslim kal jasad al wahid. The Muslim are like one body. Al mu'min lil mu'min kal bunyan yashuddu ba'dahu ba'da. The Prophet said, believers for believers are like, like a bit like a wall, like a, like a, a bit yashuddu ba'dahu ba'da. It strengthens one another. It's like a building, it gives strength. And he mentioned that there was shabbaka bayna asabi'ihi. He, he physically said, like, this is what the ummah is like. So if I feel content, okay, alhamdulillah, I'm part of the Punjabi community, Pathans are lost, or uh, I'm Gujarati and the Bengalis are lost, or I'm, I'm okay, I'm Sirati, the, it's the Dhaka guys. Well, this is just, it's just stupidity. Sahaba never thought like this. They thought we are one community. We are one, and your child's problem is my child. But I said to you, what did I say at the beginning? Because wealth crept in, brothers, you get me, brothers have ikhtilaf amongst themselves. So thinking of the wider community is an impossibility. Anyway, it's not an impossibility, it can be done. It's when your community focus is driven. We want to see ourselves not for the next 10, 20 years in UK, for the next 10, 20 centuries. We want to establish the deen of Allah. We want to be able to give the benefit of deen back to our host community and our community. This is our community now. And until and unless we stop thinking like foreigners, you'll always have one leg in, one leg out. This is my point, because it's easy just to run back to Chakwal. It's easy just to run back to Baria Town in your Koti. It's easy just to run back into Bombay or, 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 or Senegal. Bro, that's, you've got to change this way of thinking. If you're here, think of the Tarbiyah, think of Da'wah, think of Ford, think of longevity. And Islam should remain dominant because Al-Islam will ya'lu wa la yu'la. The Prophet said, Islam came to surpass and dominate, never to be subjugated and be dominated. Now that doesn't mean we present it with wrong, with attitude, fierceness, with no akhlaq. Nah. Wallahi, if you, one sheikh mentioned it so nicely, he said it in the Urdu language, I was listening to a bayan of his, and I was, this one sentence struck me, he said, Allah paak ki qasam, agar ham log apne iman pe qaim ho jaye, to kuffar ko apne kuffar mein rehna mushkil ho jayega. Oh wow, when I heard that, I was like, damn. And what he said was, he said, I swear by Allah, if the believer were to be firm on their iman, it would be difficult for the disbeliever to remain in his state of disbelief. The truth is, we water down our deen when we go in, oh, I'm the minority, you know, what are people thinking of me? And, you know, do they like me? Well, you're, you're, you've already gone in there with, a, with a, literally just a simp mentality. You're going to get rinsed. Rather, the sense of, alhamdulillah, not egotistic pride, but shukr to Allah, that alhamdulillah, wallahi, Allah has given us the best. Alhamdulillah. So nevertheless, what is social media done? What are phones done? I see, I went and said the word social media and I digress. That's why I like to have a bit of paper, because I can digress. Back to my point, social media. So I was saying, everyone, bro, it's madness because you're seeing a family of people. Everyone's just sitting on their phone smiling. Even the husband and wife, she's laughing at her thing and he's laughing at his. He's smiling at his screen, she's smiling at hers. What are, you, oh, nothing. what are you laughing? Oh, nothing, it's okay. Not even sharing the contents. We're just so absorbed in our own worlds. Now, we're not going to see the harms of this until a generation it skips. And then our, 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 our kids will be so used, they won't have any idea what it is to live without this stuff. You know? And that's why one of the things I, I strongly, which I'm going to come to, inshallah, don't worry, we're going to come to some solutions. It's not about just giving a bashing and saying, yeah, here you go. You know, no, there's some new solutions, inshallah. So the first thing is definition of family. But the harms of broken relationships, I want just to bring a highlight to this particularly. And before I do that, I want to mention one verse of Quran where Allah wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ladina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. This sufficient. Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. 
It's simply the people that Allah is addressing the believers. Save yourselves and your family from the fire, i.e. the fire of the Akhirah. I don't make yourself fuel for the fire of Jahannam. You can change yourselves. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyatihi. Each and every one of you is a guardian and every one of you is responsible for his own wards, your own flock. You get me? Everyone's responsible. So one cop out which we do, or one thing which we like to do is blame. We've got a blaming culture. So one, we've understood the need for family, and I'm gonna talk about some harms, but one thing which we need to correct in our thinking, we've got an issue where we like to blame other people for our problems. So if my kid's not right, I'll say, Yaar Pataka, you know the problem is? The Molvis, they're the problem. They're the problem, bruv. If the Molvis were okay, everything would be okay. If, if the Masjid was okay, everything would be okay. Oh, it's the committee's fault. Now this is unfair. Because do you blame the committee when your kid doesn't pass his GCSEs? Can you see how ironic it is? If shaitan makes you feel content. Any G, it's the Muslim's problem. It's the, it's the Malvi's fault. Right. You, what about you, bruv? Have you taken responsibility? It's easy for me to say next, man. But have I taken responsibility? This is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Kullukum ra'in. You're all responsible for your own flocks. Don't be pushing next man's pro your problem on somebody else. You'll be asked about your ward. You'll be asked about your flock. You can't run with this argument. No, 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 it was their fault. Okay, fine. Everyone's human. Someone may have deficiencies, problems, lack of. Cool. Okay, in the absence of all those things, as a parent, as an adult, as someone who's got aql in their brain, what did you do then to, make, make that, to fill that gap? So you can't run with this excuse. So why I'm saying this, because we hear this a lot. There's a blaming culture that exists amongst a lot of Muslims. I'm sorry to say, I, I, I mean no disrespect how I say this, but it exists very much amongst the subcontinent culture mindset. We blame others, blame others. It's your fault, it's your fault. But then I don't blame myself when my kid doesn't pass his GCSEs. You know what I mean? So you have to contextualize and see, now hold on. I, I, it's selective, isn't it? Selective. But like I said, look, I want to just share this thing with you. Because understand this one point. Our, our community's objective is not just to become super rich, although we give each other status based on this, isn't it? Okay, look how wealthy he is. Like one person introduced me to somebody, he goes, this is such and such a sub. This was their introduction. Oh, he's really rich. And you know what we do? We do this unconsciously. Someone will say, Asalaamu Alaikum, how are you doing? Okay, sorry, what do you do for a living? What do I do for a living? What's it got to do with you? <coughs> it's what they're doing, they're sizing you up. Brother, mashallah, what, what, what keeps you busy? I'm a doctor. Oh, oh yeah. I'm a dustman. I was it. All right, mate. Next one. Okay. Oh, my. You see, like this. You, it's unconsciously done. You asking somebody what they do for a living after they introduce themselves is for you unconsciously to size them up. Do I show you the respect I think you deserve or not? <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's, it's mental. Listen, this is what we do. But it's only now I brought it to your conscious attention to think, oh, my days, I do that. Oh, my days, someone did that to me. I was like, what, do you, what, do you work as well? Or are you just like, you know, what? well, of course I work, brother. Like, you know, it's just that mentality, isn't it? Oh, no, no, I just sit at home eating halva. Like, you know, what, what do you think Molvi does? You know, anyway, you're stuck for the law. The point is, is, I just go back to that point. Anyone can make a fortune. Anyone can earn money. So money's not the objective. We've made it like that. Many men can make a fortune, but very few can build a family. Many men can build a fortune, but very few can build a family. Because the skills you need to manage people are more than the skill you need to put together something to earn cash. Because humans are constantly changing. They're changing creatures. And that's why the heart is called what in Arabic? Qalb. What does qalb mean? Something to change. A, uh, what's it called? A renaissance is called an inqilab in Arabic, where something completely changes. That's what the qalb happens. I'm not going to go into qabd and bast. I'll leave that to the ulama and other time, inshallah. You can talk about this again. But the, it's the highs and lows. So we go through highs and lows. Anyway, has anybody ever heard of something called attachment theory? The very first relationship that your child has will be the relationship they model with others later on in their lives. Let me just say it like that. That is the most simplistic definition of attachment theory. You will model the same relationship with others what you've had shown to you. And the issue is, right, is that it's not a conscious decision. They don't actually consciously decide that this is what I need to do. When growing up, right, you have a level of how your relationship is. That for you is normality. Do you get it? That's normal. 
Now, it, even though it might, be it might be good, it might be destructive, it might be beneficial, it might be harmful. What happens, they go on later on in life to do recreate those scenarios to make the same family dynamics that they once had when they were kids because that's what's familiar. Do you understand what I just said? Now, it, it's funny because someone may come from you know, a house where there's a lot of arguing. On an unconscious level, they, those people are more prone to starting arguments because this is what I saw mum and dad do. It's not consciously done. No one actually goes in there consciously thinking, today I want to start a mad ruckus in my house and I want to cause a ikhtilaf. No one does that. But it's unconsciously done because it was something that you were used to do. So in the absence of something that you were used to do, you recreate it in your own life. So if you, having that kept in mind, if you want your kids to have a good future relationship, we need to be exemplary in our own. If a husband and wife showed love, muhabba, open understanding to each other, acceptance, tolerance, of course, within the boundary of deen, you get me, we're all for that. They will model exactly the same thing in their life. And funny, the mental health of a person is linked directly to the family relationships. Because what do we say? Good relationships keep us happier and healthier. That's the khulasa of that study done with 1,300 participants. So now looking forward, right, I want to share with you, before I jump onto some key ingredients, there was a, another university. They conducted a series of studies, listen to this, just done at family at dinner time. It's mad, isn't it, how, well, how wide the Western world has thought of this. We just want to see that what, what impact does having family dinner time together happen to the kids? So one study showed that kids, listen carefully, kids who eat family, dinner with their family less than three times a week were twice as likely to get C's below school. C's and below in school. It, it's, look how crazy that is. And it's not just, I want to just ask five kids across the whole, like this whole uh, Columbus University, did this whole study. And they said what? That eat, eat dinner with their family less than three times a week were twice as likely to get C's or below in their education. On the other hand, family that had dinner five or seven times, just, you're just doubling the statistic, they would do much, much better. Of course, there are other factors at play, I get that. But family dinners together likely value, they have positive impact on their family relationships. Something as small as that on a child's life. Now imagine if you were never around, or for example, now a kid says, Mom, can I talk to you? Yeah, what? Dad, can I talk to you? Huh? Like that. Bonk, nah, bonk. Like, you know, like that sort of thing. Na'udhu billah. May Allah forgive me. Astaghfirullah. But you've ultimately told that child subconsciously that my phone is more important than you. My phone is more important than my Star Plus and ARY drama, bro. <laughs> Shut up until the drama's finished. Chup chup, das min rege. Be quiet. Ten minutes are left. And the truth is, is that kids don't think things rationally, they think things emotionally. That's why they're called kids. And that's why, because they're part of their brain, so the prefrontal cortex isn't formed, they can't decipher between what is right and wrong. They think emotionally, they're emotional creatures. That's why they leave, need love and muhabba and nurturing. <laughs> they think with, their, they think with their, their hearts, not with their minds. That's why, subhanAllah, kids are so susceptible to falling into the wrong crowd, peer pressure. Because if they don't get the love at home, then they seek it outside. So I want to share with you guys, because the idea was I said I'll speak about an hour. Some key ingredients for good relationships. Now this is obviously a collection of some things I want to share with you. And just by the, for the argument's sake, not that I want to blow my own trumpet, na'udhu billah, that's not the purpose. It is, this is my line of work, okay? This is my line of work, my paid work. And alhamdulillah, I'm talking from a place of reference and evidence. I don't, I, wallahi, I'm not here to big myself up, na'udhu billah. Number one, expressing appreciation. Just learn to thank each other verbally. And basically, if needs be, even physically as well. How do you physically do it? SubhanAllah, just sometimes offer a hug. A simple thing like saying, MashaAllah, well done. Thank you so much for this. And there's some of you again, they want hadith. Man lam yashkurin nasa, lam yashkurillah. Those who don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't thank the people, they haven't thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To express thanks, to express gratitude, something as simple as saying, Jazakallah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. You know, and... Even physically, like just asking, like, thank you so much, can I have a hug? It'd be really appreciated. But have, my question to you, have we ever thanked our loved ones for being part of our life? This is a big one. Check out what I just said. So one is that you do something for me and I say thank you. You're reciprocating the good that someone done. Do you understand? You're reciprocating the thing that someone done back. 
You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You serve me food, I say thank you. You do me a favor, I do you. And you see this mentality in our community. I get messages, right? People reach out on Insta, DMs, this and that, asking some long-winded question. And I say, in my humble capacity, I believe you should consult your local ulama. No, thank you so much. It was really appreciated. Thank you for reading my 1500 line essay of a problem. No, after that message scene, not even as much as a thank you entitled mentality you owe it to me you deserve to show me no i don't i don't know who you are that, that sort of entitlement so what i'm saying is we shouldn't fall into that but that's the extreme and that exists amongst people who we nurture and smother everything the child oh mashallah you know you're an over smother that creates complete snowflakes i'm talking the other side of those people that don't say nothing at all and only scratch back. Now listen, I just said, express what? What did we say? The first thing, express what? Appreciation. Try to keep this in mind, inshallah. Expressing appreciation. But have we ever expressed appreciation for something that was not done for us? Have we ever gone up to our kids and just say, I'm so thankful that you're my son. I really love you for the sake of Allah. And I just, just want to say thank you. It's, when we think of it, it's like, ooh, sounds cringy. Like, how do I do that? It sounds so odd. If it sounds odd, there's something wrong. <laughs> Believe me, there's something wrong. I'm sharing this with you guys because I love you. Wallahi, I'm not here to waste my time. I see broken relationships. It's my mission to mend them. <laughs> this is my work. I do it with a passion, alhamdulillah. And I love doing what I do because I see the difference it makes in people's lives. Simple something like this, just by saying to your kid, look, I don't know if I've said it before. I just want you to know I love you and I thank you. That I thank Allah you're in my life. I swear by Allah, they'll remember the day you said they said that in 10 years time. If you've never said it before, it will hit home so much. Kids I've seen broken down when their parents say this to them. Okay, so maybe that's something we can do. Words of affirmation. To hear nice words is, is comforting. Words of affirmation. You know, Masha, you're doing really well, alhamdulillah. Keep up the good work. You know, it's really good what you're doing. I'm going to come to something in a second, a complete opposite to this. So back, hold in there. Expressing appreciation, not always for getting something done, just for the sake of it. Unconditional love, unconditional thanks. Within a limit, of course, because by doing it excessively, you make them into snowflakes and, and just entitled people. Oh, everyone should just thank me. Everyone should know. That's creating snowflakes. We have to also teach our kids endurance, and we'll come to that. That's another part. Another one, guys, a big one. So one is expressing appreciation. Number two is spending quality time. Now, what I mean by quality time, that doesn't mean 15 people get, or 10 people in a house and everyone's on their iPad or, 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 or their, uh, their Switch or someone's on the phone or... An, you get me? I'm talking spending quality time on a family, as a family doing things that your family like to do. And it's not the quantity, it's the quality of your time. And it's not difficult. It's to take out family time in such a way where it's exclusively just your families. Now, like I said, I've already hinted before, if we don't do this, they'll make friends outside who you don't agree with and seek even love outside from people who you don't want them to seek it from. But you created the gap in their life because you was the adult. So we have to recreate that family time Give them that thing which they seek before they seek it outside of the home. So spending quality time. And that means being available when kids need you. But it just so happened that my daughter came in. I've got three kids, alhamdulillah. My daughter came in and there was something that stressful that happened at school. So she said, I really would like to talk to you. And I was like, sure. I was literally in between submitting or something. And I said, would it be okay if, we ha if I have 10 minutes? Is that okay? Can Is that okay with you? She said, no problem at all. And to my time, I made sure I was out of my room by 9.59. Because 10 minutes means 10 minutes. Not 12, not 20, not, oh, you bully I forgot. No, you go there, 10 minutes, dot, back on, bang on. Yeah, and it just so happened, I was sitting on, on my family, uh, like just me and my missus. And again, unfortunately, my daughter came home, another issue at school, this was something else. So she said, you know, I, 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 she mentioned something about school. So instantly I put the phone down. Sorry, what's up? Go on and full diverted attention. Because that shows that that phone is not important, you are. And even better, put it in your pocket so it's not, because here it's like, keep it open, I can just see the light blinker. <laughs> put it in your pocket. Sorry, okay. Now once I put it, I said, what's up? What do you want to talk about? 
It's a, it's a simple gesture. It shows that that time is undivided. I have got your attention. It's called making quality time and you need to take this time out because kids will make a mental note of this and you, by way of your actions, will communicate whether they are more important or other people are more important for their time. And that's why, right, it's better, be it's good to, we are not better, we need to be available for our kids when they're there, but to engage in activities that kids like. To engage in activities that kids like. You know, subhanAllah, there was a study that was done that there's more, quality time is linked to better academic performance. Quality time is linked to better academic performance. So if you want your kids to do academically better, bro, spend more time with them. Spend more time with them, inshallah. But that point there, that last point before we finish off, is that spending time with family doing the things they like to do. I'm going to be, again, I'm showing you another, another example of my own personal family. Me personally, I love to do an act of service for others. It's something that brings me joy knowing that I did something for others to make them happy. So for me, making someone happy would be like cooking for them. You know, like, alhamdulillah, a couple of my students mentioned, they said, oh, well, we want to have a barbecue. I'm like, fantastic. But they said, there's a catch. You're cooking the barbecue as well. <laughs> so I was like, all right, cool. Alhamdulillah, I'm all right with that. So I had to get, you know, the meat, marinate it, cook it, everything. That's the... But for me, that's okay, because I like to serve people. I like to do that. That's what brings me a sense of joy. So now, alhamdulillah, that, not understanding that that's what I like to do, that's why, mashallah, you know, you, when it comes to, mashallah, some brothers in da'wah, ji khidmat ke liye Who's ready for khidmat? Everyone, there are certain people that love doing khidmat. It's their way of showing appreciation. So similarly, kids have their own way of doing things. They want to do certain things. If that thing is permissible within the boundary of the deen, accommodate that as and when you possibly can and negotiate spending that time. And you know, subhanAllah, while kids are young, they, they vie for the attention of the parents. Where they get so used to rejection, it comes a point they say, I don't care about them anymore. They don't care. They, they, but it's not that they don't care. They're used to not getting the attention. They had to suffice on you not caring. The other way, it's mad. You can even have someone who's in there, literally 50s, 60s. You know one guy, subhanAllah, I don't want to mention that. I had a bayan last night. So he came to me afterwards. And he was complaining that there was no structure to my bayan, there was nothing beneficial, and, and it was everything focused on the negatives. You see, what it is, is that I listened to it, and I said, there's, there's two possibilities. Either the Giza just didn't listen, because there's structure. I followed the structure, so what did you hear? The fact he didn't hear it tells me one of two things. Either you're just finding fault, or there's something deeper going on in your life. So obviously me putting on my therapist out, I said to him, how's everything, is everything going okay? What, what keeps you, what do, what do you do now? What keeps you happy? And then he went on to talk about a very, well, I do this, but you know, subhanAllah. And then I realized you're just projecting. That's all it is. What I mentioned triggered you. So now you've become a block to it. Do you get it? And now you are projecting your anger onto me. It's called games people play. That's all it is. It, it was just his way of saying that I'm triggered, but I don't know how to say it. So I'll find fault with you. And you have to be mentally ready because you need to understand that this is just what people do. To have a bit of emotional savvy yourself, it helps. Anyway, Kheb, I'll go, see I'll end up going off another direction. That wasn't what I included here, but you get the point. Spending quality time, giving that time, and doing the things which kids love to do. Otherwise, they'll display other things in other ways. And there'll come a time where they say they don't need you anyway. And that's where it's painful, subhanAllah. But bearing in mind that, like I gave you the example of that guy, he also wanted attention, but it was hard for him to ask for it. Did you get it? Human beings, they want attention. Another thing which I mentioned, appreciation, under this, it kind of links to the first point, is encouragement of individuals. And that means family as everybody. Now, when I say encouragement, take my words of advice. Never, ever humiliate your child in front of somebody or compare them to somebody else in front of the people. Don't ever do that. You will crush them internally. If you put them down, we've got, obviously there's a respect, isn't it? That, you know, my father's talking down to me in front of somebody, you know, look at this. I told him how many times and yeah, he doesn't listen. He's like this and they're listening, you know, okay, okay. But inside that is creating some mad turmoil. But they don't say nothing out of respect. Or they say, you know you, yeah? You're nothing. Look at this person, son. Look, look. Look what he's got. Look at the job he's got. Look how much money they've got. 
Look at the cars they're driving. Oh, Bagarta, what have you got? You know, so now he, what in that mind that tells, you've compared me to somebody else, that means that they're more important than me. So don't ever do it, but don't do it, never, never ever do it in front of somebody else. Now that doesn't mean we don't do nahi and amr bil ma'aruf and nahi al munkar. That's there. So people go to that extreme. Or oh, if my son's doing something wrong, I shouldn't say nothing. No, don't be dumb, bruv. You stick within the deen. If your ch- ch- do- kid's doing haram, coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning, red eye, smoking zoots, you're going to ask you, where have you been all night? Na'udhu billah, forgive me, forgive me. But it, you, you're not going to just let that ride. You're going to say, where have you been? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? That's your job. So that, don't go to that extreme. You keep them within check. I'm talking about because they did not academically do as well as what you thought they would because of your own insecurity that I wish I had this, but I don't have it. And I'm going to see my reality and dreams through my kids. So let me turn them into academic and ec- mental wrecks because I feel insufficient. So don't let that happen is what I'm trying to say. So encouragement is different from appreciation because appreciation is gratitude. Encouragement is, mashallah, you can do it. Oh, I came, I failed my test. It's okay. What can you learn? Guys, listen, always ask your kids, what do you, can you learn from this situation? What do you learn from this? You know, subhanAllah, every time you have an issue, okay, and what? And what? Okay, we came here, 139. What can I learn from that situation? What happened was, is I scrolled through my photos, saw a poster that said 145, not realizing this was yesterday's program, not today. So what do I learn from this? Read the message properly. Don't just scroll through. It's that you have to ask yourself, what did I learn from this? Learn from your mistakes. Similarly, you encourage your children the same way. What did you learn from this? What did you get from this? What can you do to make things better? You've got this and you give encouragement. Mashallah, don't worry, you didn't get this now, but there's encouragement for the future. You can do it. You've got the ability, just work harder next time. So there was one kid who had this exam and he failed and he was really upset. So he said to me, oh, I, just, I just can't do it. I said, no, it's not you can't do it. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, look, look what's happened is happened. Honestly, how many hours did you prepare? He said, mm, two days before. I'm like, said, could you maybe have done three days before, four days before? I said, what if you knew you'd get, because he got like 40, 45, so he was quite bitched upset out of 100. And every, our, our exam in the madrasa is very uniform. So everyone has the same exam. So if you're sitting with somebody who says, I got a 98, and you say, uh, bro, I got 25, you know that he hasn't prepared. You know what I mean? So he was upset. And then it was a simple thing. Of how, I could have just said to him, 45, yeah, you're, you are done, bro. Okay, next one. You know, so that's not how it works. So I called him and I'm like, okay, because he was upset, bitched So, okay, what, could be the, what can you learn from this? Um, how many days did you prepare? What could you have done differently? Um, maybe next time I need to do four days? Okay, alhamdulillah. So that, what did you learn from this? I, I need to make more effort in the future. All right, job done. Your job is to educate, to build, not to break down. Do you get it? By making them feel that they are important by giving encouragement, that doesn't mean we give... Now, this is one extreme that exists in our community and what's becoming a snowflake issue of today. I have this thing that if you have a competition and there's a winning team and a losing team, don't give the losing team a medal. Did you hear that? Don't give the losing team a medal. You know why? If you give them a medal, they're going to say, we expect to be uh, rewarded even when we lose. You're not going to teach your kids resilience. You're going to teach them to be snowflakes. Teach them how to lose. Teach them how to get back up on their feet. Teach them to be more resilient, to come back from the state of... From a state of losing It's not to, to quote famous people It's not about how hard you can hit It's about how hard you can get hit And stand up and keep on fighting back Keep coming back from adversity You understand? That's what it's all about So if I teach my kid You know you failed but here you still get a medal They're going to have this mentality That no I should always be rewarded even for my failures No learn failure It's okay You didn't pass your mark but what can you do next time? And wallahi, now we see what I've done. I've made a mental note. I'm going to encourage that kid a few days before. Son, are you studying for your exam? Remember last time? You gently encourage. And if he does better, you call him and say, look, mashallah, look what you did. Alhamdulillah. What did you do different this time? I made an effort. You see, this, you're building people. This is what it's all about. That's how you got to build kids. So that when you, when you, if you give them rewards for failing all the time, oh, everyone gets a medal for participation. No, you don't. The winners get the medals. 
You don't get a medal. And subhanAllah, we had this football match once in the Darlum where I was, right? And it, it was really emotional because it was a real mad competition between two sides and half the madrasa was split. And it was so close right to the last penalty. And one of the opposing teams, one of the teams lost. And at that time, subhanAllah, they were really emotionally struck. Like they were really upset with themselves. And I said, no, stand, put your shoulders out. You shake their hand and you thank them. Take it like a man. Learn how to take defeat and loss. You know what I'm saying? And, and you thank them for their participation. If not now, next time. Rather than going out, you know, looking for faults. Ah, oh, bro, the ref did this, the ref did that. No, you just lost. It's okay. It's okay. Re-strengthen, regroup. Inshallah, you'll do better next time. Number four, and it ties into sort of like the, the, the first one which I mentioned about expressing appreciation. They're quite closely related, but this one's communication. And when I mean communication, not you talking to them, allowing them to have a voice with you. Listen to this, what I mean by that. Attentive listening and active listening is a skill we need to develop. If a child's got something to say, it's better to... If we don't, we may not agree with everything, let them say what they've got to say. When they finish saying what they've got to say, just say, uh, have you finished? And not just say, Han, do you finish now? That's not communicating. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, okay. Thank you for sharing that. But now then you start explaining what they think and try and pick holes in their argument <coughs> in a way to try and bring back normality. So allowing them to have a voice. If you feel, if they feel like they've been heard, or rather, let's say like this, if they don't feel like they're not heard, how will they be able to communicate outside effectively and assertively if their primary carers never gave them the time to speak to them with respect and dignity? Did you get that? How are we expecting to build a community of people that we want them to be assertive? We want you to be confident. Well, how are you going to be confident if all you did was ever shut them down? So allow them to speak. It doesn't, and this is the mental mindset we need to build. You don't lose your manhood. You haven't become Besharam. This is not Bagharti. It's okay. Let, so I'm using Asian terms here, forgive me, but more like, so it's not like a lack of honor. It's not Izza, your family honor's at stake. You know what I'm saying? Allow it, just allow it. it let, hear them out. And then you start to communicate backwards that there should always be a sense of respect. You are gonna show an example that your kids will model in the future. So commun allowing them to communicate as well. Now, while we're on this subject of communication, I want to mention that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave us a simple hadith. Anzilun nas manazilahum. Simple, look at that word. Anzilun nas manazilahum. Four simple words. Subhanallah. Always come down to people's levels. You've got to come down to a kid's level and talk to them. That must sound really sad. I'm really sorry you feel like that. Now, I'm not going to speak like that to my grandfather. So you, obviously, according to their sort of, you know, their understanding and their faham and so on. But another thing is understanding the lingo that your kids use. So if someone, some kid comes in and goes, Mara, that guy was moving bare wet. I need to understand what he means by wet. You know, and that doesn't mean we need to expose ourselves to all kinds of things, but you can ask them, sorry, what does that mean? And you can understand. Alhamdulillah, I've, I've enriched myself so much by studying with kids. They're so wonderful people. Wallahi, it's such a pleasure because they teach you something every day. It's amazing, wallahi, I love what I do. It's so phenomenal. Teaching people is one of the highlights of my day. The, the therapy side is, but it's really challenging. But when I go to teach, I feel so full of energy again because they come and they're so innocent and they really want to learn with enthusiasm. So understanding their lingo, understanding what do they mean? What are they trying to communicate to you? You know, that's so effective, subhanAllah. And it's a simple thing, like one of my students, he mentioned something, he goes, oh, trust me, Mara, that was bare messy. Like, what does messy mean? So you know these words, unfortunately, then you model that sometimes, it comes out because of who you're teaching, who you're working. But alhamdulillah, it's just the way, I'm teaching you a way how to build an effect, because my initial point was some key ingredients for building good relationships. That shows that you're, they're on a level. Like I've had people say to me, I feel like you're on a level. It is, it, I'm not try it's not fake, I'm not trying to act it. It's because I take the time to understand the mindset of our youngsters. And it's easily done. But nevertheless, you need to also have an ability to adapt. And what I mean by that is, are your family able to adapt to stressful situations? And we have another five minutes and we will come to an end, inshallah. Number five, 
is your ability to adapt. And what we mean by your ability to adapt is can you grow and change when circumstances demand it? It ties back to that thing of, of, of accepting failure. So a halad has come, a difficulty has come. Like for example now, someone suddenly got ill. Do, does all hell break loose in our house? Oh, you know, freaking out, loss. How do you deal with loss? It's to exp maintain composure, strength. And to that will teach our children flexibility and adaptability. But we ourselves need to remain calm. This is why the Prophet ﷺ taught, if ever you're feeling stressed and you're standing, take a seat. If you're sitting, lie down, make wudu, drink water, you know, calm yourself. Don't show your lack of emotion in front of your kid. Don't just go wild. Because that teaches them that this person's got no control. Control a little bit. Self-control, inshallah. But by doing that, we communicate subconsciously that in times of difficulty, we also can control ourselves. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, her child had passed away, what did he say? He said that, لِلَّهِ مَا أَخَضَ وَلَهُ مَا أَعْطَ وَكُلُّ شَيْنْ عِنْدَهُ بِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّ فَالْتَصْبِرْ وَالْتَحْدَسِبْ That's it. It's Allah decides what he wants to give, and he decides what he wants to take. It, what he takes, what he gives. And everything is allotted and fixed at its right time. So therefore, make sabr, be patient, and hope reward in Allah. That's the nasiha he gave to his daughter. Imagine that. And that's the sort of thing, you know, to teach resilience. Now, moving on, this is something perhaps which doesn't need any introduction, so I can skim through this one quite quickly. And that is the religious spirit orientation of our family. And I'll give you a simple thing that needs to be done. Take out time every day, preferably, and do ta'aleem at home. Take out time to do some form of ta'aleem at home, education at home. The oneness of Allah, the tawheed of Allah, identity needs to be formed at home. Do you understand? Nowadays, the attack is very heavy on everything attacking the roots of Islam. There is no existence of God. The questioning prophethood. Is the Quran the final word? Is, is Sharia compatible with modern day thinking? It needs to update, renew. So if you are not giving a base of your children religiously, again, which is not just the Malvi's job, then it won't take time before slowly things are chipped away at that family. But again, it's to take active time every day, sit down as a family, discuss, talk, communicate, take out time for their education, inshallah. And for that, I suppose there are things where you can consult your ulama, that, you know, we, we, I, would, I would like you to give me a suggestion, Monana, something like Tawheed related, Sira related, history related. Tawheed and understanding the oneness of Allah builds your connection with Allah. Understanding about history and seerah and so on, it works on your identity. So these are things which we need because Tawheed and Aqeedah, identity, mental health, these are three crises that have affected our community. So again, it boils down to taking our time, inshallah. And fin uh, finishing off on two more points, or rather there's three. One is having social connectedness, meaning uh, do things as a family, go out as a family, spend time as a family. One is that you and alone as a kid. That's the sort of thing we said about communication. That's there, one-on-one. -on -one. But as a family, do you go out as a family? It could be something simple as, should we go for a walk today? Would you like, you know, shall we go and just, I mean, subhanAllah, where we live in Crowley, I mean, it's wonderful because we've got like parks everywhere and uh, lakes. Something similar, yeah, guys, should we just go for a walk today? Like just around the lakes, like an hour. And it's so refreshing because you're doing that as a family. There's a social, you're connected. And then as a family, we go and see other family members. And then that's, the, that's number eight, the commitment to family. So not just your family, but to the wider family. In addition to that is commitment to your own family in a way where you take responsibility for things within your own homes. Understand what I mean by that. Teaching our children that an act of service is something which is good. Teaching our children to serve others is something primarily which our deen teaches us. We have this culture where it's kind of disrespectful for the boys to do anything at home. So if the boy eats, he'll leave his plate and then walk off and the mum has to pick it up. Or even worse, they'll say, come here, pick up your brother's plate and wash it. Now that creates a big problem. First of all, it should be taught, how about you pick up your mum's plate? Why don't you tell your mum sit down and we're gonna do the khidmah for you? Why not, why do I have to pick up after you? Chutney and Jarabba on the floor, na'udhu billah, and kaprich flung left and right. What about the kids picking up his stuff? Oh no, 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 your mum will do it. You see what happens? We're just creating a vicious cycle where people think everyone's in, they have to chauffeur and cater for me. A commitment to one's own family, self-responsibility. This needs to be introduced, guys. This is point number eight, okay? There's something which needs to be done. If a kid, for example, is so used to getting people to wait on him, that needs to stop. And they need to be encouraged. Why don't you do something for your, it's not, you're not entitled. You're not entitled. It doesn't, you're not better. But in our minds, it was like this. Sons work, stay with the family, provide. Girls go out of the family, they're outsiders. 
Bro, what a dumb mentality. Qasam khudaki, that is completely nonsense. That's un-Islamic. It's culture, and that's where the culture clashes with the deen. They're equal in the sight of Allah. Your elevation and your thing is based on taqwa. Teaching them the value of serving others is a good thing. And it's mad, isn't it? Now, for example, you had one woman, she complained, she goes, Oh, my daughter-in-law, so useless. Bilkul fazool bekar. Now, what did she do, bro? Sleeps until 11 o'clock. No nashta. She doesn't even iron my son's clothes. My son has to order away takeaway three times a week. Oi, 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 barbado, yige, oi. Finished. And then another woman, it's funny because she said the same thing. Oh, son-in-law the best. Allah. His wife, she can sleep till 11 o'clock. My daughter, she can sleep until 11 o'clock. Alhamdulillah. He irons his own clothes, mashallah. Itna chai. And you know what, mashallah, he even says to her, don't cook, I'll order takeaway three times a week. Alhamdulillah. So when it's your daughter-in-law, it's all hell breaks loose. Like there was one brother and a case came. The mother-in-law made hell on earth for her daughter-in-law. You are barren, you are your banj, you're useless. Like, cause they couldn't have a kid. But then check what happened. They went to a gynecologist or a doctor and the doctor said, sorry, she's fertile, the problem's with the boy. Oh, ye to takdeer hai, ye to takdeer hai. Takdeer hai. Oh, it's takdeer. Oh, takdeer now. Why, why not takdeer before when you were rinsing next man's daughter? You know what I mean? Obviously, what happened after that, that's another story. But the point is, is, oh, now it's takdeer. I need takdeer. Oh, yeah, Allah ki taraf se, Allah ki taraf se, from Allah, it's a problem. You know, we have to just accept it now. Well, up until here, if you knew the fault was in your daughter, you would have made hell on earth and you would have told your son to divorce her. But anyway, na'udhu billah, this is the cool thing. But can you see, guys, the commitment to the family? This happens when we don't have equality within our homes. It, it affects later on things in life. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do? Kana yakunu fi mihnati ahlihi. He always used to serve his family. It was never an aib. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have come home and said, I'm not doing nothing. I'm the man of the house. You do it for me. But he himself would engage himself in quote unquote domestic things and serve his family. It's part of the khidmah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he taught us. Last but not least guys, on this thing of kind of consistency is to have boundaries. This is the last point I'm going to mention inshallah and then I'm going to come to a complete end. Is having boundaries within our families. What I mean by boundaries, if you, for example, hypothetically, if you say to your son, I'm just using son as an example, it can work with either way. Your son goes to, I don't know, school or college or something and he goes, I'll be home at seven o'clock tonight. If he walks in at 7.15 or 7.30, you need to ask, why were you 15 minutes late? Seven means seven. If you were to say, I'm coming in at eight, no problem. You we agreed this. This was the boundary. But you said seven. Why did you come in 7.30? Where was the... And subhanAllah, again, it, you know, I, I've, I've modeled this myself. And we've got this mufahama, this understanding. So my son, for example, he was out with friends and he said, I'm going to be home. And it was just so happened. It was like... Some of them, you know, after Taraweeh, they were going, I'll be home about 12 o'clock. Oh, no problem. So now 12 o'clock is coming, 11.55, and I'll, my wife is literally like a hawk watching that phone, bro. Like, he hasn't messaged yet, and he should be home in the next couple of minutes. So the message come, would it be okay if I just come back this time? Not, I'm not saying, I'm coming home here, just to let you know. No, there's, you're going to ask, mate. You're living in my house, I'm paying the bills, you listen. Not in that sense, but have them be a man as well. You get me? Don't be a pushover. One guy said, no one listens. They just do what they want to do. They come when they want to go. Well, why are you not putting your foot down as a man? That doesn't mean you be harsh, but you need to set boundaries. You get me? You're the man. And then he turned around and he goes, oh, my family, they treat me like I'm a kusra. I said, well, it's your fault then. You allowed that to happen. You've allowed that to happen by not having boundaries. Forgive me, but I'm just sharing you with you. I don't know, I don't know to call them pearls of wisdom because it's not a pearl of wisdom. It's just ruthless feedback. Stuck for the Forgive me, man. If we neglect tarbiyah, look, the results are that children, if, if they can go on by giving them these qualities, they can go on to form good, strong relationships and families of their own. If, however, it doesn't mean that they're going to be necessarily trouble free. It just means that they're able to adapt in situations and deal with the problems when they come head on. So don't think, you know, don't, families will be free after this. That's not true. You will have your problems, but you'll manage them more. You're more able to deal with them and manage them, inshallah. And by striving to do this, what happens is, is that it will help the ummah and future generations from the here on, inshallah. So it's not all doom and gloom, it's not too late. Efforts can always be made until a person is breathing. You have to take in your mind the consideration, what is the priority and what is necessity? 
And that's why we say, right, don't ever boast about what you've given your ter- family in terms of wealth. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, مَا نَحَلَ وَالِدٌ مِنْ وَلَدٍ and مَا نَحَلَ وَالِدٌ وَلَدٍ مِنْ نَحَلْ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ أَدَبِ أَدَبٍ حَسَنٍ There's no more better gift you can give your family than the gift of good manners and akhlaq. So if you want to boast about something, don't say I left them with a house or two because they might be narcissistic and completely, literally just all about themselves, snowflake, entitled people. But rather teach them the akhlaq and the manners that you are part of the ummah and a part of this community. And you need to reflect the Islamic ethos and spirit. And if you can give your children that Islamic identity, then wallahi, you will leave behind a fortune. Because remember what I said, many men can make a fortune, only very few can build a family. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah, to understand. Homeschooling versus mainstream school, what would be more beneficial for the child and family, etc., considering a lot of influence comes from school and curriculum and peers? Fantastic question. Number one, Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So in, 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 in summary, the question is, uh, for those who can hear, is homeschooling versus mainstream schools. Like, what's, what should we do? Because there is a lot of influence that comes from schools. You know what I, to- I told you about today? Look, I'm not going to say to you, schooling is not challenging. It's really difficult. Kids come home every single day. If you can foster that relationship where your kids feel comfortable to talk to you, they'll come every day with dramas because they're susceptible every single day. You know what I'm saying? Now, there's no doubt that they... But at the same time, remember one thing, bro. Listen straight up. And sorry, the sister, whoever asked the question. We're living in a country which actually upholds human rights. Yeah? One of the things of human rights is also... uh, Protected characteristics is also one of the things is religion. So don't go on like snowflakes. You stand your religious ground. You have every right to educate your children as to what you think is the right and wrong. If your kid, for, okay, let's, let's ask you a question. Do you agree, agree, do you believe in evolution? Do you believe man came from apes? No. Kufr akida. Kufr, khalas. Okay, that a man came from an ape rav. Complete kufr. Now, there's other things as well. Someone comes and says, uh, Abu Ji, today I feel like a man. Like, Bro, what are you talking about? How is that possible? So we, we, we challenge based on our religious assumptions. Like, hold on, I don't agree with this from my religious paradigm. If you're going to send your kids to a mainstream school, you need to do every, like I mentioned here, you need to take time out. You need, and that's why, what did I say? One of the suggestions was religious and spiritual connection. That was one of my point, point six, which mashallah, you guys wrote down, right? Six, you should be teaching Tawheed. You should be teaching Risala. You should be teaching the unflinching, unmoving Yaqeen that the Quran is Haq and Islam is Haq. And it's your job to do that. And that's if we can provide the antidote to some of the things that are being spread in society, then you will have normality and it's good. If it's not, and someone thinks that teaching at home is an option, that's a completely viable option. But at the same time, if you're teaching your kids at home, you need to teach them how to be socially compatible with people, how to interact and provide them a good education. I saw someone that said, oh, I'm going to provide home education, locked them in a room and just never had, they're a complete social misfit. They don't even know how to talk and communicate to people. Now, yes, that is better than irtidad and losing your deen. I get that. But the sweet spot is, is to be able to, because the truth is you can't shelter your kids forever. You've given them a phone. You, I'm just, <laughs> listen, you know, why did Ulama say TV was haram? Because of the, the, the ideas that it would have. This is worse than a TV. This is worse than a TV. Now you can selectively type in something and watch it. Now, there was a time, watershed, after 10 p.m., that's when the halagullah and all that madness happens. Bro, now you just type in some funny words, bruv, and that's it. Funny words, let's leave it as words. Not images, otherwise people will be thinking something else. The point, it's easy to fall into the trap because you've given the devices. It's only a matter of time before your kids become exposed. So the antidote to that is effort. Hence my whole argument today, the whole summary was this. The inspire people to focus more on the family unit and the kids upbringing. That was my whole essence of the bayan. And if you had to make a decision that do we provide wealth or Iman, take my advice. Cry now, but smile later, choose Iman. 
You may cry now, what I mean was that you're gonna think, oh my God, look at him, man, I got two houses, four houses. I'm like, bro, man, I'm just hit. Qasim said, you'll, you'll be upset now because that's what you immediately see. But wallahi, you'll smile afterwards. You'll say, alhamdulillah, made the right decision, man. Look at, I mean, I'm not saying, what well, look at my kim compared to theirs because they're your kids as well. You need to have fikr. But believe me, it will, you'll, you'll be a lot more better off in the long run. That's why I think may Allah guide us to what is khair inshallah. And I'm not saying we should promote only homeschool. I'm saying you have to be realistic. How long is it going to be before they get subjected to it? So I think that having a... And, and I, look, and Molana, I don't know, obviously, I, I really, guys, I really support this masjid and the, some of the stuff they're doing. What I've heard is really positive. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give you guys istiqamah. And I, I think that you should go behind your organizations and support them wholeheartedly. And if you think that there's a need in your community, like for example, you feel like you're struggling with the issue of atheism, or uh, for, how do you answer the question? Now, if someone says to you, like someone came up to me and said, why is it that you people have to fast according to the lunar calendar? Why man, you come and can't agree on just one month and fast one month? Just one month, why can't you just fast in, in March? One month, just ded dedicate a month. It sounds like a really good argument, isn't it? What day will Christmas be, brother? I'll ask you a question, Tasu. I ask you a question, right? In 25, 60 year, 69, the year, what day will Christmas be on? What date? 25th of? There you go. So they're saying, bro, the solar calendar makes more sense. But no, it doesn't. The lunar does. An average human being lives how old? Approximately 60, 70 years. That's, That's the hadith. The age of my ummah is between 60 and 70. At what age do people roughly fast, start fasting, approximately? Sorry? Yeah, 10, 11, 12, like some younger, some older. I mean, mashallah, one of my kids in the mother is seven years old, whole 30 fast, bro, all of them. Now what happened is, right, is that the lunar year changes 10 days every year, correct? So if, if Ramadan started 20th of March, which it didn't, just argument sake, next year it'll be the 10th of March, approximately, and every year it changes. In short, in your 70 year life, you will fast two winters, two summers, two autumns, and two winters. Summer, no, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Spring, two summers, two autumns, two winters. The idea of Islam is March here, the weather is pleasant. Somewhere across the country and world, it might be cold. If we're in this mindset, Christmas is always cold in UK. It's always associated. Your Islam is not fixed to any autumn, summer, spring, winter, any time. It could be long fast, it could be short fast, it could be hot, it could be cold. Despite the conditions, despite how long, when or where the fast is, a Muslim will always say labaik to the call of Allah irrespective. So it always will change in a human's life because our condition is never fixed on one thing. Whenever the condition, whatever the hour, whatever the country, whatever the season, however it's 18 for hour fast or 12 hour fast, we have one maqsad in life and that is inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. My whole existence is for Allah. That's why we rotate so a Muslim always gets with the times. A simple answer. And they say, whoo, that, that kind of makes a bit sense. I know because Islam makes sense. But you see, it's the one answer. And I'm not saying this is the only answer. This is some of the hikam, the wisdom. Some ulama have discussed that why a lunar? Like, what, you know, when Allah could have chosen something else. So, this is what, so like this, we need to learn the arguments. And I, and I say the word argument, not to say it's argumentative, but the discussions. We're going to call it the discussion, inshallah. What should, like, what should you think? Yeah, fantastic question. Did you guys hear the question? So in preparation and anticipation, for marriage life, family life, children life, and so on, what can the Muslim community do? This is what we need to learn from other communities. What have other communities, and now someone will say, quoting Umar Mukhtar, well, they are not our teachers. Bro, listen, you take the good wherever you find it, okay? Okay, so check this out. Certain religious communities, when I mention the name, they have pre-marriage courses, like how to be a parent, what to look for in a spouse. We need to, we, we, not say we need to, we can offer the same thing. Let me ask you guys a question. You know when people do these Islamic short courses, what's the first course they generally offer? Come on, have a guess, guys. Oh, don't worry about the, the camera, man. Pay attention here, inshallah. When someone, you know, you have these, I'm not saying here, but someone, people, they offer, oh, there's a new initiative, we're offering courses. What's generally the first type of course they offer? No, marriage is, it's become common now, but there's another thing. Anyone? Dajjal? 
jinn in it. These are the hot topics. Ya juj ma juj, hoy hoy. We want to go to that course. Now this is the thing. Deen, unfortunately, is becoming entertainment for us. We need to actively learn. Now what I just said to you now, wallahi, listen, take my advice. I'm a relationship therapist. I do it for a job. I'm giving you this summary and content for free. I give you the information for free. But the thing is, when and until we don't learn and take it seriously ourselves, we won't practice it. So why I'm saying, Brother Isaac asked the question, and that is the question as follows, that what do we do? I honestly urge people that we need to think out of the box. We need to get professionals on board, have the pre-marriage, have the post-marriage, have the courses involved, educate the people. At least give them the tools. And then inshallah that will serve as a base. Not to say that things won't go wrong, but it serves as a base. Now, let me ask you an honest question. Sitting here, some, I don't want to show of hands maybe, because it might, by showing the hand, it might mean that people know that there's a problem in your house. But after hearing some of the things I've said, some things land home, isn't it? Some things hit home. You know what hits home? Because you may think about how you were raised and think, damn, I, was, I really was hard done by. It's okay. It's ha it happened now. It's gone. Do something for your kids now. Do you get it? Things will hit home. And do you know what's going to happen? It always happens when I leave, people will say, Mark, can I take your number? I want to talk to you privately. The answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why is, <laughs> I'm going to say why. <laughs> Call me if you really are serious about doing something proper, let's arrange a proper day's course. And I, I, I was joking about the not thing, I don't mind sometimes, but the reality is this you've got really good ulama locally, mashallah. Utilize them. Utilize them. You know what I'm talking about? This is just making a spark. My advice is. Sit with your, if you have a genuine issue, reach out to your ulama that I think that what the, you know, what the guy said who visited, he's got some valid points, what could we do around this? And, and one thing is saying, Molina, you need to provide it. One thing is saying, you know Molina, what the brother mentioned, I'm involved in digital marketing, why don't we put forward a course, I'll give you my services for free and let's open something for the community. It needs time and effort and dedication, just as how you sit down to learn and study about things of the dunya, you need to do things for the family, because you only get one shot at it. If, if I work for a company and I'm a graphic designer and I flop a design, it's okay, I'll go back and do another one. But if you destroy the tarbiyah of your kids, you need to make, what did I say? Double the effort to bring it back to normality. Completely you're making double the effort. So while they're young, make the effort, inshallah. So that's the answer to that long-winded question. In the courses need to be provided. In the education needs to come from the member. Discussions need to happen. Read more. And inshallah, Allah will help you. Thank you.